We get out and stand behind the camper, gaping at the prospect of turning back. Going forward requires the logic of a lunatic. The force of falling water could spin out the back wheels and sweep us to the bottom of the ravine. Even if we were to miraculously survive and somehow surface near some sort of a phone, my call, I would sound like one of those Nigerian scams. My home fell over a cliff in South America and I've lost everything. Please send money so I can eat. Episode 278, Chasing Childhood Memories Down the Pan American Highway with Teresa Bruce. This episode is sponsored in part by Health IQ. Health IQ uses science and data to secure special rates on life insurance for health conscious people. Learn more and get a free quote online at healthiq.com slash adventure. You're listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast brought to you by 180 Tech. We talk with adventurers from around the globe to bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to get started in the outdoors or to keep you moving if you're already there. Now here's your host, Kurt Linville. Hi friends, Kurt here. Hey, I am excited about the guest today. It's been a little while since we did kind of a road trip adventure travel show, and that's what this one is about. I have Teresa Bruce with us, and Teresa has recently completed a book called The Drive, Searching for Lost Memories on the Pan American Highway. It's a neat flashback of a a trip redone 30 years after the fact, and I think it's going to be fantastic. But uh, this is going to be a really fun episode about road tripping through Central and South America. Teresa, welcome to the program. So glad to be here, Kurt. Thanks for asking. Oh, you bet. It's our pleasure. This is going to be a fun one. I, uh, I just returned from Mexico, Teresa, and so I have a nice context for this in my mind right now. Um, but let's start with a backstory. Who is Teresa? Where did you grow up and where are you now? I was born in Hillsboro, Oregon, but when I was a little kid, we had a tragedy in our family. When I was about seven, my younger brother was killed in a tragic accident at home, and my parents kind of lost it. They freaked out, and they moved. They wanted basically to get as far away from America, from where it happened as they could, so they built this camper, my dad did, a camper by hand. The thing weighed 14,400 pounds. Wow. The only thing about campers is like about 12,000 pounds too many. And they took off. And I was seven and my little sister was about three. And we drove all the way down the Pan American Highway as far as our camper made it. And then we moved on to South Africa where my grandparents on my dad's side lived. So I kind of grew up in South Africa and Oregon, but really, I guess I grew up on the road. It's, it's in my blood. Wow. So there are not many people that can claim that background. That's pretty (laughs) cool. So where are you now these days? Right now I'm, I live in Washington, DC. I work for a a nonprofit foundation and uh, home home permanently though is Beaufort, South Carolina. Beaufort, South Carolina. Very cool. And so first, give us just a few highlights about the original trip. You said this was in 1973, correct? It was. So the Pan American Highway had just been unofficially completed. Not much was known about it. It's basically a system of roads, not one straight up highway that it was designed to connect the capitals of Latin America and it had it had been in like National Geographic and a couple of things, but really not a lot was known about it. And my parents certainly didn't know anything about it or Latin America. Like they were just average people coping with the loss of their only son. And so they didn't know what they were getting into. Uh, they didn't speak Spanish and they had hardly any money. They didn't really save for this. They just kind of escaped by doing this road trip. So the first road trip was um, an adventure, (laughs) to say the least, but we broke down 61 times. Wow. 61 times. How is this possible? Yeah, pretty much everything. And it it all kind of went down by the fact that the camper that my dad made himself out of like scrap wood and parts he kind of salvaged and and, uh, got from various work sites weighed 14,400 pounds. And so it was way too heavy for this uh, truck that he used. And so there was just every imaginable 
problem with the truck. So my first recollections of, of a year on the Pan American Highway was literally almost on the side of the road because it would break <laughs> down so many times. My poor dad would be like under this truck, jacking it up, bartering for parts, hitchhiking into small towns he couldn't even pronounce to try and like show a welder a horribly abused piece of machinery and get them to replicate it. But while he was off doing that, my little sister and I got to really sort of see South America, see Central America, get to know what it really was. And so we got pretty proficient at Spanish. We had a great time. We were these cute little girls. So we got invited into the homes and hearts of so many people along the way that it just started a lifelong appreciation for this continent and the cultures that you find along it. Wow. Wow, that's really, really cool. What a unique background to have that as part of your life story. And you mentioned before I hit record here that this has made you a passionate road tripper. So what does it mean to be a passionate road tripper? It means you never really know a place until you drive through it and and travel through it, not not be a tourist or a visitor, there's a whole different perspective you get when you take your time and you, you unplug a little. You don't, you don't plan every detail. You don't have to get to the airport three hours in advance and check schedules. There's a freedom to road trips. And that freedom, after you let it settle in your bones and, and kind of get over your um, Pavlovian need to like check schedules and emails and, and alarm clocks, there's a freedom to it. And I think that's how you really experience other people's cultures and you really grow and there, there's nothing like a road trip and I've done this now twice down the to the end of the Pan American Highway and back and once as a little kid through through civil wars and earthquakes and was fine I'm safe I'm sound I'm a better um, person because of it so I'm always an advocate for get out on the road and don't be intimidated by going south of the border and I mean way south of the border that sounds fascinating. So I think a lot of people are intimidated, actually. You know, they're intimidated by the the stories that they hear about the border towns just getting into Mexico. They're mm-hmm. intimidated by language differences. They're concerned about, will I get good fuel? Will the roads tear up my vehicle? What kind of roads will there be? Will I be able to drive when the, the traffic's going to be really different than it is here? I mean, there's so many question marks out there. Can you fill in some of those gaps for us? Let us know what it's really like. Sure. Well, first of all, having uh, lived in Washington, D.C., I can tell you that the roads here are worse than almost anywhere in South America. <laughs> there you go. Um, so, you know, we we had a four-wheel drive, and we only really needed it in a couple of countries where we were really going off the main road. We were going up into mountain towns, and then it was super helpful. I'm not going to lie. But... Just to do a road trip, you really don't need any kind of special vehicle. I mean, I think it helps to have a camper so that you're not tied to towns with hotels. But, you know, whatever you got, just just go with it and, and it'll be worth it. I think the only thing that was worse than I expected, especially in Mexico, were these things called topes. I don't know if you saw them. But they are speed bump crazy hmm. in Mexico. And every little village is have, have a tope coming in and a tope coming out. And instead of a speed bump, it's it's like a giant uh, mound that you have to go over to get in. And it's designed to make you slow down and, and see the place, which in a sense is good. But they are bone jarring. So, so that would be one thing to look out for when you're on a road trip through, especially Mexico. Um, topes can be, can be a killer. But I think the real danger is really being an, being overprepared. I mean, if you're overprepared and, and you're plotting everything out mile by mile, then you're going to miss the point of being on the road. I did that. I was super paranoid. I'm like a control person. I thought I had to have everything plotted out and planned ahead of time. I had I bought every kind of insurance that you could. I had a satellite phone with me because I thought, oh my God, what if I get carjacked? And um, <laughs> like, what good that would have done? I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I had like emergency evacuation insurance, although that turned out to be too expensive to keep up. So I kind of overprepared and was over worried about it. And that really taught me a lesson that, you know, I never needed any of that. And in fact, whenever a few things would happen, like uh, my husband broke his hand at one point during the journey, 
they treated us for free and gave us so much wonderful attention and care that it was like it almost made you just feel embarrassed for how paranoid I was getting started. So I think the thing is just to have some good maps and a good sense of humor and not be in a rush. Take your time. And any of those obstacles that you might be afraid of, you're going to be able to handle. That's, that's reassuring. I have to go back to the topes because um, <laughs> I've got a crazy story about that. And it wasn't Mexico. It was actually Kenya. But we were trying to get back to home base in what they call a matatu, which is, it could be anything from a pickup to a van. And this was a, a foreign style van that had a little motorcycle engine in it and seated 12 people on plywood. You kind of get the mm-hmm. picture. Yep. Um, it had been a really long day. And we had been with this driver of the Matatu. He's our friend for a long time. And so he allowed one of us to drive. Now we're driving on the left side of the road instead of the right. It's nighttime. It's Kenya. And on top of all of that, it's foggy. So the the friend who was driving was going a little too fast for the foggy conditions and came to one of these oversized speed bumps. Mm-hmm. And you can imagine, we all went airborne. We all banged our heads on the ceiling of the van. Um, all four tires hit and bounced, and he managed somehow to keep it on the road and, uh, <laughs> and shocked us, you know. But then he thought he was, he was all home free, and so he floors it to speed up again. And, of course, there's another one just a few hundred yards down the road, and the Kenyans with it are all screaming in Swahili or Kalinjan or Kisi or whatever their local tongue is, and my friend driving had no idea what they were trying to tell him, and he hit the second one and went airborne. <laughs> and so by the time it was said and done, we had to rebuild the suspension on the van. <laughs> yeah, rebuilding the suspension. I have a story that probably tops that. Um, at the first trip down the Pan American Highway in 1973, that truck took so much damage that the entire frame broke. And on the side of the highway in, in the Satura Desert of northern Panama or northern Peru, my dad had to just literally jack it up and jerry rig a solution and and pull it back together. And that wasn't even with a tope. That's just the beating that you take on some of those roads. Hmm. We did the trip um, 30 years later. We had a Ford F-350. So that started out on a lot better leg than an old, old truck. Um, and we did have a few times where the camper would really shift in the bed because it was just so bumpy and we would just kind of, my husband would, would grab the tie out cables and kind of yank himself up the side of the vehicle and lift it up enough for me to wedge pieces of wood and stones underneath it to level it off. So yeah, the, it, your, your vehicles, um, need a lot of coaxing and loving words of encouragement to get through some of these situations. <laughs> Goodness. So watch out for the topes. That's the moral of that story. And it, it's probably good to have reliable transportation. So you're in an F-350 and a camper on back, right? Mm-hmm. A 1968 Avion truck camper. So this thing is a beauty. It's kind of like um, an Airstream truck camper, but I think it predates it a little bit. And we found one used for $1,200 from an original owner in Wisconsin. And she was a thing of beauty. And my father-in-law refurbished it and, uh, you know, got it so that it was winterized and leak proofed to the best of our our capabilities. And uh, we took off. So in a sense, the truck was new, but the camper was about the same vintage as the first camper. And the camper was actually the tougher thing to keep going. You know, mm. an old camper just kind of, uh, its bones ached after, after a couple of months on the Pan American. Right, I can imagine. So let's, let's kind of rewind. I would like to hear what your, now we're talking about the second trip, not the first okay. trip, but yeah. I would like to hear what your route was, just to kind of give us some context. And then we can dive into some great stories about what you experienced. Okay, great. Yeah, well, we crossed into Mexico at Nogales, um, and then we headed straight for the coast, and so we paralleled uh, the Pacific down to uh, San Blas and Mazatlan, and then cut in and headed for the Mexican highlands in Chiapas, and we went over the Guatemala border in the mountains, 
And then we went through basically all of the, the mountain towns with fun names like Chichicas Tenango, Weiwei Tenango, Salala, and all of those, those towns. And we followed the Pan American Highway when it basically paralleled what my parents' trip was in 1973. And then a couple of times we were just um, too curious to stick on that route. So we would go off on side trips and discover um, other circuits that were maybe not open back then. So we went all the way down, down the coast. So we went through Guatemala, Honduras, uh, Costa Rica, Nicaragua into Panama, and then the, t- the trick is is that once you get to Panama City, there is no overland route to South America because you arrive at the Darien Gap, which is such thick jungle that you, you can't drive through it, and nor would you really want to. I mean, A, you'd, you'd rip up the environment, which is, is really pristine, but also it's, it's very dangerous, and there's a lot of narco-trafficking and a lot of um, – wars between um, indigenous communities. So you really can't drive through it. So we had to find a container ship, a roll-on, roll-off freighter to move the rig um, across. And when my, when on the first trip, we went from um, Panama to Colón in, in Colombia and went that route. But there was no way to do that when in when we did the trip in 2003. Colombia was just way too dangerous with, with – um, the, the narco terrorism that was going on. So we ended up shipping our rig from Panama to Manta, Ecuador. And then after 9-11, you're not allowed to go on freighter ships with cargo. So we had to fly over and meet the camper in Ecuador. And then mm. we continued. So we drove down on the Pan American through Ecuador into Peru and Bolivia and ultimately Argentina and Chile. Wow. Did you go all the way down to Ushuaia? We did. We made it. The interesting thing is that was my parents' first goal in 1973. But like I said, 61 breakdowns on that rig, they couldn't make it. So they had to sell the first camper for scrap um, to a farmer in Bolivia. And that was sort of the impetus for the second trip was we thought, you know, I wonder if that camper is still out there. And so my dad thought, no way, you know, it's been burned for scrap 30 years ago, but he kept maps and he kept slides, 35 millimeter slides of all the towns that we we were in and, and events along the way. And then my mother kept this little tiny journal. It was more like a ship's log. It wasn't like a, you know... Uh, poetic journal per se, but it, it did catalog like where we stopped, what we ate. And the cool thing here, Curtis, is that she wrote down occasionally people's names in towns. And they were generally people that had really helped us out of a tight spot. Like the time when I got malaria as a kid and oh. they found somebody who helped nurse us back to health. So on the second trip, I got a chance to look up some of those people and hunt them down and walk around towns looking for these people that hadn't seen me in 30 years. And that was literally the best part of the road trip is finding these, these, I don't know, I almost think of them as angel travel, traveler angels, right. you know, people that, that just kind of swoop in when you really, really need help. And they sometimes, they, they somehow just are there. And these people, I was able to reconnect with a few of them, and it was just amazing. Well, that explains the subtitle to your book, then, Searching for Lost Memories on the Pan American Highway. Indeed, indeed. Awesome. Well, what a neat experience. I don't think there are many people that could say that they could try to rebuild a childhood trip 30 years after the fact. And I guess you mentioned to me, um, you and your husband were visiting with your dad and your mom, and your husband had the idea, let's do it again, let's rebuild it. So your husband, it was your husband's idea. How, did he have to work hard to convince you, or were you just on board from the start? No, he had to really convince me. I thought it was crazy. Like I said, I'm like an Um, very organized person. I had a great career going. We both did. And it just seemed like completely, I don't know, irresponsible just to give it all up on this, this whim to see, Hey, I wonder if we could drive the Pan American and find the old camper. But it was after nine 11 and a lot of things had been changing and he just kept, you know, pestering me with this idea. And finally we just decided, you know what? So it just kind of hit me that, I was prioritizing the wrong things in life. I was just so worked up about schedules and jobs and careers and checking off lists. 
And it suddenly hit me, you know, life is short and there's so much out there that, that you can experience if you're just willing to let go and, and let go of some of that control. So we decided to do it and uh, he never regretted it and neither did I. It was the trip of a lifetime. Wow. Really, really cool. So I, I have to ask this question and it's a question I've asked several guests, but I really love to hear your perspective on it. People in the United States are often caught up in a career, not just a job, but a career. And to do a trip of this magnitude means they're probably going to have to quit their job. I mean, some might be able to get an extended leave of absence or something, but some people are afraid they're not just quitting a job. They might be quitting a career, which that's a whole different thing. Would you respond to that? How how do you feel about taking that risk? Was it worth it? Would you do it again? Would you recommend other people consider it seriously? I do. I, I did have to give up a whole career. I mean, I had, we had no backup plan. We weren't 20 year old backpackers, you know, between jobs or just out of college. You know, we gave up, we sold our house. We, my husband had, he's a, he's a cinematographer and he sold his camera to help buy the, the truck. So we really put it all on the line and, you know, it, it was so worth it. I didn't do it lightly. I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, you know, just let, let things happen and see what, where life takes you. I really planned it and saved and, and just had to have the confidence that I could rebuild a career. The career isn't something that defines you. It's something that, that you should still feel joy in doing. And as long as you do, you can come back and create it again. And I think you have, you have an added perspective. You have a depth, you have even some wisdom if you're lucky at the end of a, of a big sojourn like that, that, will help you reestablish it. You just have to have a little confidence in yourself and plan. You know, I, I wouldn't just jump into it lightly because, you know, people have obligations and that's, that's certainly a responsibility you got to consider, but I would never let it get in the way of, if you really have a passion, if this is something that is just sticking with you and you, and you, you wake up at night thinking about it, it's probably a sign that you should do it. Hey friends, Kurt here. You know, we might have the healthiest audience of any podcast on the planet. I don't know. It, it, it just seems to me that people that are out there doing adventure sports have to be pretty healthy. They appreciate being healthy and they love to get out there and move. And we recently got a new sponsor, Health IQ, and they reward people who love to be healthy. This is cool stuff. So do you exercise five times a week? If so, then you probably think you deserve a different rate on your life insurance. You're not the smoker. You're not the one who's out there abusing his or her body and and having a lot of health issues that result. Instead, you're out there moving and eating right and doing right things. So shouldn't your premiums be lower? Health IQ uses science and data to secure special rates on life insurance for health-conscious people like cyclists, runners, strength trainers, vegans, and more. Matter of fact, research shows that those who frequently exercise with some intensity have a 22% lower cancer risk, a 56% lower heart disease risk, and up to a 34% lower risk of an early death. So why not get rewarded for that? Historically, you get penalized for your family history, body mass index, and other attributes, but you don't get rewarded for your health-conscious lifestyle. Well, Health IQ does reward you for your health-conscious lifestyle with special rates on life insurance. How cool is that? To get more information and a free quote, go to healthiq.com forward slash adventure and make sure you do use that forward slash adventure that makes sure that they know where you heard about them on the Adventure Sports Podcast. So healthiq.com forward slash adventure. Thanks, guys. It's about time for some of this health-related life insurance. I love it.
So how hard was it to plug back into a career once the trip was over? Um, it wasn't at all. I think, I mean, I took some time to write and um, ended up writing a, another book in the interim. And I mean, I got right back into it. I don't think it's hard. It was harder actually to recalibrate just your own sense of pace and timing. Like after living a year on the road where you didn't have alarm clocks and you didn't have deadlines, um, it was hard to see the importance of those things. And you see everyone else kind of rushing around always in a, in a hurry, always stressed out. And it, it took a while to sort of let that lifestyle be yours again, if you know what I mean. And, and to a certain degree, I never let it all way, come all the way back. There were things that I was able to keep from the road, that sense that you don't actually have to control everything. And I don't know, I kind of found that the things that I spent the most time planning and fixated on never happened the way I planned anyway. So it kind of taught me, you know, why go there to begin with, just try to let some things happen, and go with it and see where it takes you. And I was able to recalibrate and regroup and, and jump back into the work world. And you know, it was an adjustment. But I think I think I, I, I would still recommend that people give it a try. If you're compelled, if you're passionate about doing it, you'll find a way to make it work. You know, Teresa, there's an element of what I'm getting ready to say and what you just said. And that is, when we gain perspective from other cultures and life experiences that we have along the way, we bring that back into, you know, the, the Western culture, and uh, it, it can make life richer and give us perspectives that help us through daily life. I've heard a lot of people say that. I think that travel is so valuable because of the way it expands our understanding of the way the world works. So what would you say was one of the more valuable lessons that you learned on your trip? Well, you know, at one point it was interesting. We were in the um, Ecuadorian highlands on, on something called the Quilotion Circuit, which is this system of back roads way high up that circle around some volcanoes. And we came upon this town of Chugchilan, and we, we met this mom who was cooking potato stew in the town square for workers coming in from the fields. Well, two of those workers were her daughters who were like 12 and 14, mm. Blanca and Ariana. I'll always remember them. And Gary asked if he could take their picture. And they said, yes. And then we said to them, they said, can we show our father? And we said, um, well, it, he was actually shooting black and white films. So I said, well, we'll get the film processed in the next big city and we'll print something and mail it to you. What's your address? And these girls looked at me and they didn't know what I meant. And I was using the right words, but they they had no need for the word of address wow. because they, they were already home. Home was their whole universe. Home was their connected. The Spanish word de means from and of. And, and that was really kind of an eye opener. Here I was searching for a home that I had 30 years earlier and trying to kind of find my place and find my way there. And these girls never needed an address before. They already knew where they were. And I think that that sort of certainty is something that settles in you when you travel. Mm. That's, that's neat. That's really neat. So one more question about what we've already been talking about, because I'm just so curious. What was your, bigger, or your biggest obstacle to actually doing the trip, the biggest fear, or what was holding you back the most? Mm, the biggest fear was I had a 16 year old cancer stricken dog. So the biggest, biggest decision was, you know, what do we do? Do we take her with us? Do we leave her with a friend? And we had many takers, her name's Wipeout, and she is, is uh, beloved. But I didn't think she would survive the whole year. And so I didn't want to leave her with a friend if she didn't make it. Right. But I was terrified of, of something happening on the road. And that was the hardest decision to make, was realizing that it would impact every place we went. But And you actually have to get canine visas to drive with a dog through Latin America for each country. So it was a huge hassle, but it was also wonderful. I mean, she opened doors and hearts for us the way... I did and my little sister did for my parents 30 years earlier. So I completely recommend traveling with A, little kids, or B, with cute dogs. Even <laughs> right on. 
on their last legs. It's still worth it. And I think Latin America is one of the last places where you can. Nobody even thinks twice. You know, they're just part of your family. And so even though, sadly, Wipeout didn't make it the entire trip, mm. she got to have the last few months of her life was, was fabulous. You know, she was on the adventure on the road trip with us. She was in the back seat, her head on my shoulder, you know, drooling into my, into my ear and smelling all the same smells and loving it as much as I did. How cool to add that dimension to the trip. That's neat. I would like to now kind of shift into more about the book itself, because I know that this trip is in the book, right? So it is. <laughs> um, the name of the book, again, is The Drive, and Teresa Bruce, the author. But I also want, before we start just diving into the book, you said that your, your husband, Gary, is a photographer and that you have amazing pictures of this trip as well. How can people be a part of that and see what's, what's going on there? Oh, I'd love for them to be a part of it. So when we did the trip in 2003, uh, this thing called blogging hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> it was just starting. We didn't even know what it was. So I took notes and he took photographs and he's a professional um, cinematographer and fine art photographer. So he had some amazing material. So what I'm doing is kind of coinciding with the launch of the book. My blog, which is um, TeresaBruce.me, you can follow along. It's kind of a road trip retrospective. So every day of the drive, I call it like drive day one minus 14 years, drive day two minus 14 years. And you can parallel where we were. And then every blog is centered around a photograph from the journey, sometimes even some little videos. So it's a great way. I mean, there were so many images that were so striking and that's how I write. Like I, I respond to, to the, to the visual first. And so for me, these photographs were just great jumping off points. And so this blog, you kind of follow along, you, you sort of get to hitch a ride in the backseat of this road trip and you don't even have to pitch in for gas. Cool. So say the URL again. It's at Teresa Bruce.me. So it's just T E R E S A, the Spanish way, Teresa Bruce.me. And you can follow along. And then there's a website, um, Teresa Bruce Books.com. And that you can link into it that way. And, you know, the usual Twitter and Facebook. But I would love for road trippers to join in this with me and kind of take a back seat and go along for the ride. Awesome. Very, very cool. So would you share with us some more details about what people can expect from the book? Is this a how to guide or a memoir of, of the experiences that you had or more about life lessons learned along the way, or how would you describe it overall? Hmm. I would say it's a, it's a, an adventurous memoir. So it's going along the trip and it's not a detailed, like, you know, and stay here, campground guide, go to this spot, not another. It's definitely not that book. It is really just kind of what we were feeling, how we were experiencing these cultures, and just kind of telling the stories that happen along the way. And the whole point of it is to try and find the old camper. So, you know, that was what was driving me. But as I went along, I realized, wow, what was more important we're reconnecting with these people that had helped us before. And so those to me were the highlights. And I think anyone who's ever um, taken a chance and kind of developed a friendship or, or just extended a welcome to someone who's traveling through will really get that. And uh, those, those were the most amazing moments. Cool. But there were some pretty harrowing, you know, parts too. It's, it's not, it's not an easy drive, but it's well worth it. But, but yeah, there were some moments that, um, Got your heart racing. So the book has it all. <laughs> it does. It does. I think it's a book that that everyone will enjoy reading, armchair travelers, but especially just people who love driving, love love experiencing new things, and, and really have an appreciation for, for beauty of all kind. I think they're going to get a real uh, charge out of this. Would you be so kind as to read an, an ex excerpt or two from the book so we can kind of get a, a flavor of it? All right. I would love to. So I should make a confession. Out of my paranoia at the beginning of this trip, I read every single thing I could about every country I could because I didn't want to be in the position my parents were 30 years ago where they were caught short and off guard about conflicts and wars and things that were happening. But as the result of all of this research and the fact that generally you only see, hear the negative things about Latin America in, in newspapers here – I got super paranoid and I, oh, this is so embarrassing to admit, but I 
made my father-in-law buy me a gun and I hid it under the floorboards of our truck camper through 13 borders. Wow. And it was <laughs> the dumbest thing I could have ever done. And I paid for my sins in many, many, many ways by mostly just being so scared at every border crossing that I literally made myself physically sick. Um, but it was, it was part of the story and, um, I was always terrified. And when we first started out, I hadn't even touched a gun and neither had my husband. So a 70 year old friend took us to a firing range in Arizona and had basically told me, listen, if you ever, uh, pull this gun out, you're going to have to squeeze the trigger to kill somebody and leave. And I I couldn't do it, but I couldn't get rid of the gun either. So I, I, I hid it under the floorboards and it becomes this sort of like, Oh, just horrible albatross throughout the trip. But it's also kind of funny. So I'd like to read a little part about that that brings that into play, if that works. You bet. Sounds good. Okay, so we're in Chiapas, and we hit a police roadblock where they're searching vehicles. Oh, no. Yeah. My panicked strategy is to get in first and sit at the kitchen table with my feet firmly planted on the section of carpet that covers our gun's cubbyhole. Planting his ass over an illegal gun worked for my father in Bolivia. I can think of no better plan myself. But the soldier leaps inside before I can pull out the step stool to hoist myself up. I am eye level with the camper's floor, and Joe's slice in the carpet looks amateur and obvious. I look up at the soldier's face to keep from staring at the hiding place. And for a second, his disgusted grimace doesn't make sense. The smell hits me at the precise moment I see the shattered pickle bottle on the floor. (laughs) Somewhere between the isthmus winds and hitting speed bumps the size of felled logs, our pantry door flew open and Martin's mescal did not survive the fall. Hours of 100-degree temperatures inside the camper accelerated the disintegration process of mezcal and dog piss-covered carpet fibers. The stench could peel the aluminum off the camper's frame. (laughs) So that's just one story that happened. And, of course, you know, luckily for me, the combination of my aging dog's bladder and uh, a huge bottle of mezcal that we had uh, bought the day before prevented me or more likely my husband from winding up in a Mexican jail for um, an gun. Wow. How funny is that? A little bit of providence there, I think. So Teresa, a lot of people might feel tempted to do what you did to say, I've got to have some sort of self-defense to take along the way. In the end, did you feel like it was needed or had you wished that you just left it back in the States? Oh, it was the worst decision I made on the entire trip because it really changes the kind of traveler I was. You know, I'm a pretty open-minded, I love Latin America. I wanted to almost like thank the people that had helped us before. And here I was essentially smuggling a gun in, kind of pre-thinking that I'm going to be the victim of some sort of violence. And in fact, nothing like that happened. We were treated so well and helped out of so many situations that each time it was like a little stag, a, a little dagger of guilt in my conscience. And yet then, in the end, you couldn't get rid of it, right? Like, you can't just go and say, uh, hey, I'd like to give away this gun. It's <laughs> oh, no. You can't sell it. I couldn't leave it in the camper when we left. So at the very end, I mean, this thing literally was my albatross. I mean, I felt so bad about it. And, and I always felt like my husband had every right to just yell and be so mad because he didn't want to do it. I was the one that, that convinced him. Uh, that I had to have this gun and he never did. He just kind of let me, <laughs> let me sit there in my worry about this gun. So finally at the very end at the, um, at the Beagle channel in uh, Tierra del Fuego, we realized, I realized I had made it down the entire Pan American highway without needing this thing. And in fact, this, this gun having been the worst decision of my life. So we waited until sunset And we opened a bottle of Argentinian champagne and I pitched that pistol into the, into the channel and watched it sink out of sight. And (laughs) I never had a better day in my life. That was the best thing I could have done because it solved the dilemma. I was, I was done with the gun and I didn't have to try and get rid of it. So it only took me, you know, 
18,000 odd miles to get to that decision, but I finally did the right thing. You know, I, I know that this is not a metaphor, but it sounds like a metaphor. It sounds like you're carrying some burden that in the end you didn't need and you pitched it. Was there an element of that going on besides the gun? There was. You know, I kind of realized that the whole person that I had become, this person who really thought she had to control everything and and plan for every emergency, it wasn't just that, like, I was born that way. And I'm sure everybody kind of appreciates it. But, you know, I thought, well, why was I? And I realized that the first trip had a lot to do with it. There were 61 major breakdowns. It, my my sister was really injured. I was sick. Things happened that were so scary and mm. so completely out of my control that I think I I became that little tough person back then that thought she had to control everything. And what I realized through the course of being able to retrace that journey as an adult was that the only way that it controlled me is if I let it. And so I finally Emily said, you know what, I'm going to give that part up. I'm, I'm not going to assume the worst. I'm not going to become that person. I'm not going to keep that albatross with me. And so it, it really was a metaphor for what you learn through travel when I, when I chucked that gun into the salty water. <laughs> that's really cool. That, that's really cool. I love the perspective that it gave you and also the, the testimony that you just gave. You never needed it. I that never, your, journey, yeah. your journey was safe. Right. And so let's talk about safety just a little bit. Did you ever feel threatened or were there dangers or would you just say, no, it's actually pretty mild? There were, um, not where you, only, I guess where you would expect. We, we tried to see, uh, get to Palenque in, in, um, Southern Mexico and there were residual, um, riots and roadblocks that, that I thought were related, um, to, Zapatistas and that kind of, of infighting. And in, in, in fact, it was a little bit, but it was also just um, local indigenous groups trying to um, uh, control sellouts to uh, that, that they considered scabs and drivers. So there, you can get enmeshed and you can quickly find yourself in local political flare-ups. And those were dangerous, but not anything that I think you need to um, stay away from traveling because honestly that could happen at a, um, a demonstration outside an embassy here. You know what I mean? It's things like that are going to happen. And one time I remember um, you can almost overreact. So we were in Antigua, Guatemala, and there wasn't much in the way of campgrounds there. So we were camped outside of a gas station (laughs) in in a beautiful spot, but still And in the middle of the night, the camper was shaking back and forth. And I thought, Oh my God, someone is going to tip the camper and rob us completely irrational thought. But I went for the gun. I grabbed it. I I dug it out from the hiding place. And my husband jumped out of the the vehicle with a broomstick. He refused to touch the gun. (laughs) And, um, we found out the next, there was nothing there. And we were just like, it, it really shook us. I, I was just kind of disgusted with myself that I had that reaction that I, that I grabbed for the gun. And the next day, we found out it had been an earthquake. Wow. So here I was going to shoot the earthquake, I guess. You know, it was just it, the idiocy, the lunacy of it hit me. And I went, okay. So I actually never took the gun out ever again. I kept it in the hiding place. And even one time in Nicaragua, when in the middle of the night, we heard um, a gun shot over the camper. I didn't let it take that country away from me. I didn't grab it. I didn't go for that gun. I refused to let my fear steal that country from me. And it felt much better after that. So, so I think the dangers are more what we imagine and how we react to what we think is going to happen than the actual thing itself. Mm, Yeah, I can see that for sure. No doubt about it. Here's a question for you. So you're in an F-350, um, probably looks pretty American, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it, the reason I bring it up, when I when I was in Mexico, that, you know, I mentioned when we just returned, well, we were being tourists, not travelers, I have to highlight that, but we were certainly thrown into the um, local gringo camp, meaning mm-hmm. that, you know, they, they've seen tourists go down and do the stupidest things. And there were so many people that were trying to protect us from ourselves. But I started to feel like, man, I wish that I looked Mexican 
and that I knew the language better so I could just enjoy, you know, getting to know the real people more. So did you feel like the F-350 drew the wrong kind of attention or did it all work out in the end? Uh, It was kind of the elephant in the room. It did feel like very conspicuously American. And many travelers were like, dude, why don't you put a Canadian plate or a Canadian flag on you? (laughs) Hide the fact that you're ugly Americans. And you know what? I decided, no, this country also needs ambassadors as well. You know, and I like as I didn't want to prejudge every country, I didn't want every person to prejudge me. And so I, we took it, you know, and, and honestly, if we had a dollar for every time, uh, a local person asked to see the engine, we could have financed the whole trip. That truck was a beauty for one thing. And so people, whenever, if we would go into a market and come out, there would be a line of men usually waiting to see if if Gary would pop the hood and let him take a look. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. For, yeah, it it was conspicuously American, but on the other hand, it was a conversation starter and people loved looking at that truck. So, so, you know, it goes both ways. Well, what about the language? How important is it to have a command of the language in the country that you're visiting? I'm not going to lie. It's going to help. I speak pretty well. My husband didn't speak a word, but he managed very well too. And and toward the end, when we got into like Argentina and Chile, the Spanish is so different there that I was struggling to kind of control it and listen to the verbs and, and try to get the grammar right. Whereas my husband just kind of paid attention to body language and, and gestures, and he almost understood more than I did. So I think if you can give yourself a stab at that language, you're going to, you're going to enjoy it. And it allows for conversations and allows you basically to express your appreciation. But if you can't, you know, don't let that stand in your way, just just give it an attempt. And at least in Latin America, any attempt is appreciated. It's, it's the farthest from like a snobby continent that you can imagine. So any attempt will be appreciated and it makes you feel good and it makes you keep trying. Bentgate Mountaineering, located in Golden, Colorado, has been outfitting backcountry travelers for the last 20 years. Spring has sprung, but there's still a lot of great skiing in the backcountry, and it's prime time to check out the latest in alpine touring, telemark, NTN, and split boarding gear. Bentgate carries the premier brands, including Black Crows, DPS, Dinafit, G3, Icelandic, K2, Rocky Mountain Underground, Rosignol, Solomon, Voli, Never Summer, and Jones. With more people in the backcountry than ever, it's crucial to be prepared. Bentgate has the latest in avalanche safety gear from beacons to airbags. Come in and they will set you up with the proper gear and point you in the right direction to educate yourself on snow safety. If you don't own the gear, Bentgate offers a full range of rental and demo equipment, including the latest skis, boots, split boards, beacons, shovels, and probes. Bentgate also hosts free demo ski days at local resorts to give you a hands-on opportunity to ride the latest gear. Be sure to check bentgate.com for their full product selection, as well as updates on all of their events. Hey, just a quick reminder to head on over to members.adventuresportspodcast.com and start up your own membership. This is where you can get great deals on adventure services and products, as well as help support the show. Thanks, guys. You know, I have to say, I've been to Mexico a couple of times and to other foreign countries, and people are so kind and and helpful. And that was our experience again in Mexico this time. They just, they were so pleasant and helpful and kind, even when we were being loco gringos, right? (laughs) And so that's been my experience. Absolutely. So let's see here. We're going to run out of time, which I hate it because I'm, I'm really enjoying what you're telling us so much. But I have to ask for tips or tricks for people that would be interested in doing something similar. What would you recommend? I mean, it's kind of overwhelming. Where do you start? 
Well, um, my first advice, number one, would be to unplug. I mean, the whole point of doing a road trip is to slow down, take your time, discover things on your own. So I am a big advocate of like old school paper maps that you fold out on the hood of your truck and you look at every morning and you think about where you're at. It helps you get oriented. It helps you really sort of place yourself in a way that a little screen or Siri talking back at you is never going to do. So, you know, even if your maps are out of date, I would say go with some maps, unplug. And, you know, hey, if you get lost, it's just a chance to make a connection with the local. I'd also say slow down. You know, it's better to plan an itinerary that doesn't take in so many miles or so many stops as you might be able to do in a given amount of time than rush through it. I mean, you just an overly ambitious itinerary makes it like a race instead of a journey. And every time we tried to make it to a certain place for an event or something like we wanted to get to Oaxaca for Galgatza, we felt like we rushed through and cheated ourselves of some of the spaces between. And those like pauses between exclamation points are really what you remember in the end. That's where you really get the flavor of the country. Mm. So I would say definitely slow down. And probably the most important tip was one that my husband and I did. We didn't plan it this way, but I think it was after my insistence on the gun and, and my husband knew then that I was really afraid. And so He said, let's just take this pledge. If either one of us ever has a really bad feeling about a place or has the heebie-jeebies that you speak up and you turn around and you get out of there without complaining, without second guessing or belittling each other. And honestly, that pledge was the way that I felt most, it, it made me feel safer than any gun I could have had. Because basically instinct is the best insurance policy. And, and if you respect it, you're also respecting each other. So my big advice on a road trip, if you're traveling with other people, is respect each other's instincts and take that pledge that if any one of you has a gut horrible feeling about a situation or a place to just no questions asked, get out of there. And that way there's, you know, you're free to really feel the place instead of worrying about how you're going to respond. Yeah, that's a good idea. Very good idea. You know, we interviewed some other guys who traveled together and they decided before their trip that if they ever got to the point where they could not agree on what to do next, they would flip a coin. Exactly. (laughs) And I think that helps a lot, but it might mean you make the wrong decision. There are another couple of guys who did a different trip and their uh, agreement in the beginning was, if we get to the point we can't agree on something, we'll take the most conservative of the two choices. And I thought that was kind of cool, too. But what you just said was, if either person feels like the scene has to change, we don't question it. We just go. Exactly. And you know what? It, it, it only happened once on our entire trip. And I almost didn't even have to say it. Gary just said, this isn't going to happen. And we turned around. And it was just, we were in a, a, in a particularly bad neighborhood of a, of a slum. And some people started jumping on the, on the running boards and We just decided, you know what, getting to the end of that town wasn't worth it. We'd go a different route. And that pledge, I think a lot of people said to us, oh, my God, you're 24-7, you're newlyweds, you're with each other all the time. Aren't you afraid it's going to hurt your relationship? And I think things like that pledge made me answer no. I mean, you just travel is the best way to cement a relationship as well. Really cool tips. Love that. Love that. So I have to say we're out of time, and I don't want to because I'm having so much fun here, but I'll bet you have another excerpt from the book that you could read to kind of close out. Okay, I do. So let me find this. This is just for for you adventure travelers out there. Everyone always wonders what the roads in Bolivia are like. So this is a point where we uh, have to find out. A rocky outcrop ahead hovers like an oasis, the space below its overhanging ledge providing protection from some sort of waterfall until we realize we have to drive through it. The road doubles back itself on a hairpin turn directly under a torrent of water cascading over the ledge. It is as if two giant fingers pinched the sky to the road and flicked the edge of the earth 300 feet down on the other side just for spite. We get out and stand behind the camper, gaping at the prospect of turning back. 
going forward requires the logic of a lunatic. The force of falling water could spin out the back wheels and sweep us to the bottom of the ravine. Even if we were to miraculously survive and somehow surface near some sort of a phone, my call, I would sound like one of those Nigerian scams. My home fell over a cliff in South America and I've lost <laughs> everything. Please send money so I can eat. So that was our only really, really desperate moment with the truck. But to find out how it happened, you're just going to have to read the book. Oh, I was going to ask for the finish. But okay, you have to read the book. People are going to want to read the book. So we're going to be airing this show on Monday, June 12th. And your book comes out on the 13th. So it's just tomorrow when the book hits the shelves, right? I am so excited. You guys are going to be able to uh, go online to Amazon or Audible or any bookstore, and it'll be on the shelves June 13th. All right. So everybody, while you're listening to this, put a little reminder that'll pop up tomorrow that says, grab that book because you know it's going to be awesome. And I can't wait to hear the Audible version. That's really, really cool. Thanks. So who read the book on Audible? I did. Nice. Well, you've got a beautiful voice. Uh, you mentioned that you were in media before, so I'm sure that that reading has to be awesome. It was a lot of fun. It brought back a great memory, and uh, it's just it's a it's a story that isn't the typical memoir because it's not just saying this happened and this happened. There's a real plot to it, and I think um, you learn a lot along the way. Well, I'm so jealous, Teresa. It sounds like such a great life experience that you and Gary had, and I have to say thank you for putting it into a book so that we can enjoy it too. Once again, the name of the book is The Drive, with a subtitle of Searching for Lost Memories on the Pan American Highway. And it can be found on Amazon and Audible. And one more time, Teresa, what are the URLs for your blog and your book website? Uh, the website is TeresaBruceBooks.com, and that's Teresa without the H. And the blog is TeresaBruce.me, so uh, follow along. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. You are most welcome. And for all our listeners out there, as always, get out there and have some fun. Maybe it's a trip this time, an adventurous road trip. Read Teresa's book. I'm sure it will inspire you. Coming up on Thursday's episode, Kurt and I talk about backpacking and the Lost Creek Wilderness in the middle of Colorado. Until then, get out and have some fun. <laughs>